Good morning and welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. For our friends joining us via drive-in, if I could get a honk so I can know you can hear us okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. And to all of our friends who are joining us on Facebook Live via the internet or listening over the phone, good morning and welcome to all of you as well. I am thankful that all of you are able to join us on this first Sunday after Christmas. Um, I'm trying to think if we have any announcements. Do you have any? Nothing? Anybody? Once? Twice? I feel like there was probably something, but I'm not remembering now, so... Alrighty, well, let us move on to our worship service. If you will join with me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God from the heavens. Young men and women alike, old and young together. Let us praise the name of the Lord. Alleluia. Please join with me now as we do our opening hymn, Sing Me Now at Christmas, printed in your bulletin. Please join with me in the opening prayer. Saving God, the prophet prophet Anna Anna and and righteous righteous Simeon, Simeon, sang your your praise praise and and proclaim Jesus Jesus our Lord to to all who who are looking for the the redemption redemption of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Let Let us who seek redemption redemption in this day prepare prepare our our hearts that we may may believe the good good news of Jesus. Jesus. Receive the light of salvation and live according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Away in the Manger. Oh, 
Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. As all the dim children in thy tender care and fed us for heaven to live with thee. If you'd please join aloud with me in our prayer of illumination. As you led Simeon to embrace the infant Jesus, guide us, Holy Spirit, by your gracious light, that we may welcome your saving word. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is taken from the 61st chapter of Isaiah verses 10 through 62, 3. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with garland and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The second reading it's called the Vindication and Salvation of Zion. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication signs out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be crowned of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. As the earth brings forth its shoots and a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so will God cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. With thankful hearts, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God.
If you would please join me in our doxology. Loving God, we give you thanks for the light of the world, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received adoption as your children. With Jesus, our brother, we dedicate ourselves in ministry to the world that we may live as heirs of your promises to the honor and glory of your name. Amen. If you'd please join me now in an attitude of prayer. Holy God, we come before you this first Sunday after Christmas, still feeling the warmth and the celebrations and the buzz and the joy of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, even in spite of the strange place we find ourselves in in this year with this pandemic and many other events. We give you thanks for the blessing of your Son and for all the blessings that we have had bestowed upon us that we enjoy, even the ones that we may not be fully aware of. Lord, you taught us to bring everything to you in prayer, so we also lift to you our prayers of concern, prayers of asking for healing for all of those who are suffering, whether physically, emotionally, or mentally. We lift up prayers for those who are in mourning today, having lost someone close to them, someone they love. Losing a loved one is something that we as humanity struggle with greatly. I ask that you would help those who are mourning today to remember that there is no right way to do it. We all mourn in our own time, in our own ways. And I ask for your comforting presence and peace to be with them during these challenging days. We also want to give thanks for all of those who work so hard to help us stay healthy in our lives, from doctors and nurses to surgeons and lab technicians and research scientists and so many others involved in the healing and health care process. Lord, we ask that you would guide their hands and their efforts. We thank you for their sacrifice of their time and their energy. And we pray that all of those in need of healing might experience healing soon. We also give you thanks today for those who work so hard to keep us safe in this world. We give you thanks for those who serve in our military and armed forces, for all of our police officers and firefighters and first responders and so many others who are sacrificing of their time, their energy, in some cases, their own well-being to keep us safe. We ask that you would guide their hearts, their minds, their words, their actions, keep them safe and strong. And Lord God, we ask that those who are serving far away from home might be able to return home soon, and we could begin to see an end to conflict in this world. We also give you thanks this day for our nation and every nation in this world. And God, we ask that you would help the leaders of our nations find ways to come together to work for the betterments of all humanity, not just a select few. Touch their hearts and minds and touch also our hearts and minds that we may see one another as you see us, as your beloved children, all equally deserving of love, mercy, grace, and being. All of these things, as well as those we keep quietly upon our own hearts and minds, we lift to you this day in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus, our Lord, came into an indifferent world, yet his life revealed the inner thoughts of many. Let us confess our sins before God and one another that we may receive release from our sin. If you would please join aloud with me in our prayer of confession. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we confess, we confess that, that we have not lived, lived as, as your faithful, faithful children. children. We, have we have kept silence in the midst, in the midst of prejudice, prejudice and, and hatred. hatred. We have been idle in the face of violence and injustice. We have not been a light to the nations, and our lives have not revealed your glory. Forgive us, merciful God, repair the ugliness of our sin, and restore in us your beautiful grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please take a few moments for silent prayer and confession. Beloved of God, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, God covers us with the robe of righteousness. Know that you are forgiven in Jesus Christ and live as God's beloved. Amen. Shall we join together now in reciting the Apostles' Creed? I, I believe, believe in God, God the Father our Almighty. Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven is seated, seated at, at the right, right hand of the Father, and, and will come, come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We will now hear the third scripture for the morning, taken from the book of Galatians, chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children and because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Excuse me. Our next hymn this morning is What Child Is This?
Our last scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. This section begins titled, Jesus is Presented in the Temple. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Falun, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there fasting and praying night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you would please join me again in an attitude of prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the blessing of your Son, our Savior. We thank you for Mary and Joseph who cared for and raised him throughout his life. We thank you for the angels and the shepherds and all of those who brought the good news of Jesus' birth to the world. And we thank you for the work of Christmas that you call us to through the examples and teachings of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day have come and gone. Presents were given and opened. Food was prepared and eaten. And new memories have been made. So what happens now? What do we have to look towards now that this incredibly special event has passed? This year is not over just yet. There is still time for the aliens to land, right? Just kidding. I hope. I know that as a child, after Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, my sisters and I had a few days of playing with our new toys and get, would get together with some of our other extended family members to exchange gifts and share a meal. We enjoyed the time away from school, and there was usually some time for rest in there and playing in, in the snow if we had had some that, that particular year. And then we would get, begin preparing with our parents for New Year's Eve. Every year, for as long as I can remember back, my mom would make 
um, a bunch of snacks and appetizers and some pizza, and we would watch movies all night until the countdown would begin to New Year's Day. I can still remember taking a trip to our local video store to rent some movies with my sisters and my dad. Wow, that makes me feel old just saying that. Anyway, and then, in just a few short days, life was back to normal. My sisters and I returned to school every day, my parents back to work. As a young child, I didn't fully understand the season of Lent and Easter, and they seemed so far away. So life was just back to normal. And maybe it's because this year has been anything but normal. But in the time leading up to Advent, I found myself wondering what life was like for Mary and Joseph, and of course, little little baby Jesus, after Jesus' birth, and the shepherds coming, and all the craziness that had occurred for them. Well, thankfully, we get a little bit of insight into that very reality in our reading from Luke's Gospel today. Our reading began with when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, I want to be clear, this was not like the next day after Jesus was born. There was a 40-day purification time for mothers after giving birth that they had to wait to pass for Mary. Also, seven days after Jesus was born, he was circumcised as per the Jewish tradition. So it was just over a month after Jesus was born that the family traveled to Jerusalem to present Jesus to the Lord as it was written in the law of the Lord. And we are told that they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now what is not told to us in our reading, but is known to us now through scholarly work and historical records, is that this was not the normal offering necessarily that would be offered when presenting your firstborn to the Lord. What we find when looking back at Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8, is that this offering of two turtle doves or young pigeons was permitted for those who were too poor to afford a lamb as the offering. So based on that, we can safely assume that Mary and Joseph were not very well off financially at this stage in their family life. And it may not be hard for many of us to picture this small family just starting out low on money, probably a little tired from caring for a newborn who, despite what some of our Christmas hymns might say, was not likely a perfect little sleeper all of the time. If we claim that Jesus was both human and divine, we must also be willing to admit that he probably woke up crying in the middle of the night at least a few times. After the offering is made, we are told about the family's interaction with two elderly people who were extremely devout in their faith, and they walked with God. And much like a grandparent or even great-grandparent might fawn over a new addition to their family, so too do these two people in their own way. Simeon holds baby Jesus and praises God for letting him live to see this day when he would meet the holy child, the salvation of their people. Anna, a woman who never left the temple and worshipped constantly, fasting and praying all day and night, she, when she sees Jesus, prophesied about how he would be the redemption of Jerusalem. You cannot tell me that this doesn't sound at least a little bit like a proud first-time grandparent bragging about their new bundle of joy and showing you a billion pictures of them. And who could blame them? Children are a gift from God, right? Most of the time, anyways? No, children are, are a gift. And at least in my own experiences, the good times and memories far outweigh the challenging ones. And this was not just any child, this was the Son of God. This was Emmanuel, God with us. According to many scholars, Jesus was literally 
Yeshua, which means Savior, as we see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Now, we don't have a whole lot of information about Jesus' childhood and him growing up, so we can't say for sure if this was one of the last normal times in the family's life or if things were relatively quiet and typical like most families of that time. There are other writings that make claims about Jesus' childhood and growing up, but they're not considered canon and there are many questions about their legitimacy, so we don't include them. But what about right now today? Now that Christmas Eve and Christmas Day are over, do we just go back to life as normal or as normal as it can be? Are we just kind of coasting until New Year's Eve and New Year's Day and then back to the grindstone? That again, assu that again assumes that the aliens do not land or something else ridiculous doesn't come up. Well, according to some people, the real work of Christmas has just begun. During our Advent Bible study in our last session, we read a poem by Howard Thurman from one of his collections of works titled The Mood of Christmas and Other Celebrations. If you are unfamiliar with Mr. Thurman, he was an American author, philosopher, theologian, educator, and civil rights leader that lived from 1899 until 1981. The poem we read is titled, The Work of Christmas, and I would like to read it to you all now. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. I really like this poem, and I even posted it on both church's Facebook pages and my own not long back. This poem talks about how after everything is back to normal, if you will, that the real work of Christmas begins. And Thurman didn't mean Jesus' work or God's work that was beginning. Thurman means that our work of Christmas now begins. It is our work to find the lost. It is our work to heal the broken. It is our work to feed the hungry. It is our work to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people. And it is our work to make music in the heart. I really love that last line. It, it just sticks with me and makes me kind of smile. But this is all our work that we are called to do now, to begin this work. The good news in all of this, though, at least to me, is that this is work that we are not just called to, but that we are equipped to do. God does not call the equipped, but rather God equips those God calls. This is work that you are already engaged in. Find the lost. Well, how many of you have invited someone to church? How many of you reach out to share God's love and grace to others through not just words, but through how you live your life and how you love your neighbor? From what I have seen, I think you are all doing that, even if you're not always realizing that that's what you're doing. What about healing the broken? How many of you have reached out to your friends and others whom you know who are struggling? When they lose someone from their life, are you offering comfort and support? When they are struggling with their health, how many of you offer to get groceries or other help around the house? Again, from what I have seen, most of, if not all of you, are already doing this kind of thing. And feeding the hungry? I mean, come on. We're United Methodists. It's not a fully sanctioned or official event or meeting for us if there's not some kind of food served. 
It actually used to be that a casserole was required, but they relaxed that rule back in the early 80s or 90s, I believe. I'd have to consult the latest book of discipline to be sure. In all seriousness, though, you guys are good at feeding the hungry. From operating a food bank to delivering meals to shut-ins and so much more. And I would argue that you have helped feed the hungry spiritually and intellectually, especially intellectually, through the work and donations for the schools that you have done. Release the prisoner. Well, that depends on how you think about the word prisoner. I'm not aware of anyone running a jailbreak recently. But how many people are prisoners in their own minds, in their own hearts? How many people are suffering as prisoners of their pasts? And yet, I have never experienced or heard a story about someone being turned away from this church because of their past or their struggle. That helps free people in ways that we may not even fully understand. Rebuilding the nations. Well, that one might be a little bit tougher, but then again, maybe not. When we give our ministry shares to the United Methodist Church, some of that money goes to UMCOR or the United Methodist Committee on Relief. UMCOR works around the world in places that have been devastated by natural disasters and war. Every time we help and give resources to UMCOR, we are helping to rebuild the nations. What about bringing peace among the people? I think the way I see that happening is through all of the outreach work that you are all doing. When, you, or when people feel loved, when people feel heard, when people feel like they matter in the lives or in the eyes of others, they are much more likely to experience and feel a sense of peace. And of course, what about making music in the heart? I said this was my favorite line in the poem, and I truly mean that. When we show God's love and grace to others by our words and our actions, when we love our neighbors, that makes music in my heart. And I am sure it makes music in God's heart, too. My heart sings with joy when I see people helping one another, loving one another, showing mercy and grace to one another. And since I have been here with all of you, my heart has been a 24-hour music station playing the most beautiful music I have ever heard. The work of Christmas begins now. It is work that we have already been doing and work that I know that you will continue to do. It is work that I know that God has not just called you to, but equipped you for. It is work that makes music in the hearts of those who do the work and those who experience the benefits of that work. It has been a year. And even though I have only been with you for half of it, I can say without any hesitation that you all make music in my heart through everything you do. From your prayers, your time, your talents, and everything else. Thank you for being a light to the world, especially during this crazy year. Thank you for welcoming me and my family into yours. May God bless you, and may we all have a happy new year. Amen. If you would join with me as you are able for our closing hymn number 240, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Beloved children of God, go forth into the world rejoicing. Spread the good news of Christ, our light and our Redeemer. May God, Redeemer of Israel, dismiss us in peace. May Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Mary, uphold us in love. May the Holy Spirit, the power of God, guide us in truth. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining us and have a blessed week.